Thank you, friends. It's an absolute privilege to be here uh, today, and I bring you greetings uh, from our union, the Australian Education Union, a union that covers preschools, schools, and TAFE, education support staff, teachers, principals, uh, TAFE lecturers, uh, HPI instructors, and the list goes on. Um, we, I also would like to bring you greetings from Susan Hopgood, our General Secretary, uh, who I know many of you are very familiar with and have met uh, in your travels. When we begin our meetings in Australia, uh, we acknowledge the Aboriginal and Torres Strait Islander people of our land and their strong history, and so I would like to do uh, a similar greeting for you today. So today I pay my respects and I acknowledge the elders of this land on which we are meeting, and I acknowledge their strong spiritual and cultural connection to this country and I thank them for hosting me on this country. I'd also like to acknowledge Linda and Paul, uh, the members of the uh, NZEI executive bodies and you our sisters and brothers uh, in education and in union. I'd like to acknowledge our previous speakers and well be in the spirit of your presentation. I'll give a big shout out to Principal Ted Wright of Streaky Bay Area School, and Jane and Peter Needle, and Felicity uh, Wilton, who saw in a 15-year-old disengaged girl who had actually left school to go fishing with her grandfather as a decky, saw something and encouraged uh, her to return to school, and consequently she's speaking to you today. So I think we all have a very, uh, you know, I think we have those tinges in our lives that. Uh, have changed our lives and isn't that what we hope to do for our students uh, every single day. And I'd also like to say that no matter where we are in the world, it's reassuring that we can come together at these conferences and that we can learn from each other, we can share our stories and we can grow together as we navigate some of the challenges that we have, not only in education, but also the social challenges that we have and I'm going to spend a little bit of time uh, talking about those today because now more than ever, we need to have international solidarity. We need to understand the impact of what is happening in our own countries and the ramifications of those uh, decisions or issues for the region. I was in, excuse me, I was in Fiji just recently and uh, was shocked to learn that my government has been selling some of their bad policy and practices to our Pacifica neighbours. And so, you know, from each other, we do have to learn, I think, so that we are prepared for whatever might come. But also today we find ourselves in the middle of a crisis, which is not only challenging education, but a crisis which is challenging the resilience of our public uh, and our democratic institutions. And it's a crisis that's clearly evidenced by the behaviour of people such as Donald Trump and by our own Prime Minister, Malcolm Turnbull. Much of the social and political order is shifting beneath our feet. But one thing is certain, one thing is certain in these times, and that is that the best way to confront these turbulent times is to invest in the educators and the teachers and the education support staff and the leaders in our preschool schools and our vocational education uh, institutes because they are the people who will teach the next generation to stand up and to be proud. <coughs> And it's also very, very important that as education unions that we campaign for that and that's why uh, we have watched with interest your own New Zealand election campaign over the past, uh, past few weeks and we were very hopeful that you may have been able to achieve what we were not able to achieve in Australia last year at the federal election and that is the tossing out your, uh, your government. Um, so as we wait for the outcome, uh, I express our solidarity for your struggle and for your future campaigning, whatever your government looks like. And I think if there's one bit of advice that I can give you, is that if you end up with a, uh, a, a conservative government again, uh, with a slim majority, then look to what's happened in Australia. Because in Australia, the difference at the federal election last year between a Malcolm Turnbull uh, coalition government and a Bill Shorten Labor government was just 12,000 votes. That was the difference. And the Turnbull government has a one-seat majority, and as that's played out over the past 12 months, those 12,000 votes have cost us so much in attacks on workers' rights, in attacks on our unions, and of course, uh, for public education. 
So before I get to the key education issues, I've just realised I'll leave my pointer now, um, I want to share some thoughts with you on the current states of politics in Australia. The first being the constitutional crisis which is facing the term of government with that one seat majority. And who knew that Barnaby Joyce, our Deputy Prime Minister, was actually a New Zealand citizen? So he, along with several other politicians, is now in front of the courts waiting to see if they've breached the electoral processes by virtue of holding dual citizenship. Constitutional lawyers uh, actually think it's a pretty open and shut uh, case and that they have breached that, but um, it's going to be dragged through the courts by our government because of that one seat majority and uh, in an attempt to stave off what I think everyone in Australia thinks is actually inevitable. But I also want to say thank you for your wonderful sense of humour in nominating him as uh, New Zealander of the Year. <laughs> we'd, uh, we'd be very happy for you to actually keep him, to be honest. Um, <laughs> But this is a court case that could topple the Turnbull government, and so we now find ourselves preparing for an early election as we watch this play out. And as part of that, we have experienced very strong attacks on the union movement from the Turnbull government, very aggressive anti-worker and anti-union legislation uh, continues to surface in Parliament, and I'll talk about that uh, in, a, in a little while. But also the attacks on the fundamental rights, the fundamental rights of citizens, uh, and this is a picture that I carry with me wherever I go because this is a picture uh, that was drawn by a child in detention. Australia continues to be the only country in the world whose first choice in terms of children is putting them in detention when they are seeking um, asylum. And under our watch, it's not only these children, but it's their parents, their families, and friends, refugees and asylum seekers who have been persecuted, who have been assaulted, both physically and sexually, who have lost their lives and suffered serious mental health issues. Just recently, over 400 uh, people who had been granted temporary residence in Australia had their status changed so that overnight they lost their accommodation and their financial support was withdrawn. These are people with families who have lost everything. And now our country has given them three weeks to vacate their temporary accommodation and to go out and find a job. It's just appalling. Many of the women have been removed from Manus or Nauru after being raped and suffering severe trauma. And so men, women and children residing in Australia have now been given six months to leave. The choice being to go back to uh, Nauru or Manus or to return to their own countries at great risk to themselves. Every day in Australia brings new levels of bigotry, hatred and racism from people like Immigration Minister Peter Dutton, a man who seems to have no humanity and a vile, evil set of policies. And our record on human rights is a source of international shame. But let me give you some hope because the people are fighting back. This is not going to happen on our watch. We have mobilised through organisations such as the Asylum Seeker Resource Centre, through Welcome to Australia to provide food, to provide accommodation for these people in the short term while we work on the campaign for the long term solution. We will not let the government get away with this. We can cover their physical needs, but the longer term damage for these people in terms of their own health and wellbeing is going to be much harder to repair, particularly when their futures are so uncertain. And until we have a government that is prepared to change these appalling policies and practices, then I very much fear that these human rights abuses will continue. And I should no doubt be aware, <coughs> there is another issue in Australia currently, a very significant human right which is being denied LGBTIQ people in Australia, and that's the right to marry their loved ones. Excuse me if I get a bit emotional in this section, because this is playing out in a very nasty way in Australia. So instead of taking leadership on marriage equality by ensuring a parliamentary vote, Malcolm Turnbull has enacted the same-sex marriage equality survey, a survey of public opinion about same-sex marriage. It's not binding on any politician. It's not even being conducted by the Electoral Commission. Instead, the Bureau of Statistics is running it, and it will have no legal status, just a public one. And over the past few weeks, sorry, yeah, yeah, over the past few weeks, 
Um, we have seen the Coalition for Marriage Vote No campaign vilify our LGBTIQ friends and their relationships. We've seen past PM Tony Abbott and the Australian Conservative Senator Cory Minardi lead the far right hate brigade and try to make this survey about everything but marriage equality. In particular, they've attacked our schools and the curriculum package called Safe Schools, which is an anti-bullying program for our students. Just last week in South Australia, in my hometown um, of Adelaide, Craig Byrne Primary School, Year 5 students, decided to hold an end of term fundraiser for a charity organisation called Do It In A Dress, where kids are encouraged to put in a gold coin donation and come to school in a school dress or a dress to support girls in Africa who cannot attend school. And they hope to raise $900 for a crowdfunding website. Well, Corey Bernardi got out there and he unleashed a storm of hatred on the school which made front page news. He accused the staff of forcing boys to wear dress. He said it was observed gender morphing of the students and tied them to the same-sex marriage survey. One of our well-known comedians, Josh Thomas, got hold of this and he unleashed a Twitter and social media storm when he started off by donating $1,000 to the school's fundraising page. <laughs> Twitter and Facebook went wild, let me tell you. Photos of men and boys dressed in, in dresses flooded social media, and once the funding platform went public, it trended for 24 hours, and by Friday, the school had raised over $300,000. So. And I think the best, the, the best moment for me was when the Chief Executive of the Education Department in South Australia, a guy called Rick Purse, also posted a picture of himself and his staff wearing a dress on social media. And it was a fantastic moment in what has been an otherwise very bitter, hostile um, social conversation in Australia. Not only are we being asked to have an opinion about same-sex marriage, but it's become an opinion poll in general on the validity of the LGBTIQs communities' relationships with their partners. And I have watched my friends and my colleagues struggle through this day to day. And personally, I have felt very deep emotions as I've seen this play out. The hateful social media postings, the TV ads, the vote no skywriting above capital cities, the physical and mental abuse of same-sex couples, the graffiti. We've had bricks through house windows that have dared to fly the rainbow flag. And I can't even imagine the pain that's being felt by my friends um, as, they, as they wait for the outcome of this. But I can see it on their faces and I can see it through their postings um, on social media. It is a very dark time in Australia for human rights and we are fearful that a no result for this survey will seal the fate of marriage equality for many, many years. And the deeper issue for us, of course, as educators is that there are significant mental health uh, and personal wellbeing issues that may take years for our students in our schools to overcome um, and for our teachers. It is polling in the direction of a yes vote at the moment, but we cannot take that for guaranteed. So we have been forced into a situation by the Turnbull government where we have had to get out there and campaign, despite the fact that what we actually want is a parliamentary vote on this. We have been forced to campaign for a yes vote in this survey. So moving to education. And uh, my favourite topic, the Gonski campaign. This is a story of inequality um, in Australia, and I've put this picture up here because this is data that's been taken off of the My School website, which tells the story of the financial distribution for our students uh, in our schools. It's fairly self-evident, so I'm not going to take you through it. But uh, as you may have been aware, because I'm sure um, uh, Angelo, as the previous president, would have also shared the funding story uh, in Australia. We have been in a decade-long fight for fair funding for public schools, and we've mobilised the education sector and the broader community, and we've built a community campaign of over 170,000 people. And these are people who primarily are not our members. They're the people that we've been able to connect with in the community. It's been a very important part of changing the dialogue around education and funding in Australia. We've built it 
through identifying the inequalities that our schools face when they're denied the resources that they need to work with their students. Australia is a very large country, um, as you know, with many students being educated in rural and very remote locations. And for these students, we've got clear data that shows that their schools receive funding that is well below the national benchmark. We have a benchmark now in Australia called the Schooling Resource Standard. And it's the cost that um, has been determined that is the cost of educating a child in Australia. So it's become a publicly acceptable uh, uh, mechanism to use in terms of benchmarking that cost. And it was established by the previous Gonski Review in 2011 uh, in terms of that concept. So in real terms for our students, funding gaps have meant that schools have not been able to invest in teachers, they've not been able to invest in educational support staff and in learning programs to assist with whatever curriculum needs a child has, whether it be literacy or numeracy development or speech pathology um, or so on. And for our Aboriginal and Torres Strait Islander children in particular, uh, we know that we have student achievement gaps of up to three years uh, below students who come from a more advantaged background. And as a country, we are yet to deal with that very critical issue. Many of these children experience compound disadvantage. Not only are they living in a rural and remote location, their first language is not English. Their communities experience high rates of poverty, ongoing health issues, uh, youth suicide, drug and alcohol addiction, and that's had a significant impact uh, for those students and their education. But where we have invested in our schools with the first four years of Gonski, with only 30% of the promised funding that was meant to come in under this program, then we have been able to demonstrate the difference that resources make, and many of our schools have been able to address some of the social issues um, that these children have bring to school with the appointment of additional teachers and educational support staff. I visited a school recently uh, that was running a, a literacy program for students. And at this school, a child in year seven, so in Australia, that's uh, somewhere between 12 or 13 years of age, said to her teacher, I can read. And for the first time this year, I've read a book. Now that just grabs me because, you know, it's a simple pleasure that so many of us take for granted. Uh, and is so life-changing for our child and for a child who uh, gets to the end of, end of the primary schooling um, without actually having, you know, had that wonderful exposure to everything that books bring. So this stuff is life-changing and we have seen many, many programs of success in, in Australia um, with this funding. And over that decade, through the Igibagonski campaign, uh, we've shifted the federal government's commitment in a positive direction for funding public schools. I'll tell you the back story about this in a moment, or the next story. So we were on track by 2019 to have the vast majority of public schools at 95% of that schooling resource mark. So not quite there, but almost there in two years' time. That was our story, that's where we were going. That was the commitment from the previous Labor government. They were the agreements that were signed to deliver the funding between state and federal governments. And then along comes Malcolm Turnbull. And I'm very sad to say, Malcolm Turnbull has a fundamental commitment to funding the private sector that he doesn't have to funding the public sector, and that's supported by his cabinet. We've seen many comments over the past few years about how the coalition government believes they have a greater, a, a greater uh, role in terms of funding the private sector and not the public sector, because that should just be left to the states. So three months ago, we hit a major hurdle. We hit a major hurdle in that the Turnbull government brought in a new funding model for our schools, which will mean that over the next six years, 87% of public schools in Australia will be below the national funding benchmark while 65% of private schools will be above it. In delivering this, on the very day that this legislation passed through Parliament, despite our very best efforts and many, many weeks lobbying crossbench senators, he stood up at a Liberal Party Federal Council dinner and he announced it as a budget cut and a budget saving uh, in terms of education. So $17 billion um, in terms of tearing up the agreements that were put in place to deliver those funds by 2019. And this is our story now in Australia in terms of the federal government and their plans. It's driven by the Turbul government's ideology, their desire to be the primary funders of private schools and to leave the funding of the public sectors to the eight 
state and territory governments in Australia, but it doesn't take into account the fundamental principle that the Gonski Review identified in 2011 in terms of needs-based funding and putting funding where it's needed most doesn't take into account that the federal government has the greatest capacity to raise revenue through taxes, nor does it take into account the fact that the vast majority of private schools in Australia also have vast private sources of income. It's the first time in the history of our country that we have a cap on federal funding, a legislated cap on federal funding. So they have capped their funding share at 20% for the public sector and they will deliver 80% of that benchmark to the private sector. So it leaves the states and territories to try and find the additional 80% um, of funding for our schools. But there's great uncertainty about whether they can do that because it shifts billions and billions and billions of dollars of funds um, to the states, many of whom have their own, their own issues as well. Just a graphic there to show you what we're up against. So six years' time at the end of their plan, that's the story for our schools. What does it mean on the ground? I thought I'd share this with you because this is where we're at right now. So these figures uh, represent the share in terms of the schooling resource standard for um, states and also for the federal government. If you have a look at the state line, you will see that many of them are not at that 80%. Those that are, like Western Australia and the ACT, can actually reduce their funding. So while the Fed's cap there is at 20, those two states can actually bring their state funding down. But for the rest of them, um, it's going to take, it's a very difficult journey to get to that point. The Northern Territory in particular, on the ground, it's going to have a huge impact. This is the, the territory educates our most disadvantaged students the majority of which are Aboriginal and Torres Strait Islander students. And what this plan means is a $70 million reduction in funds delivered to that territory. And um, that's replicated around the nation. Just in the next two years alone, we lose $3 billion. The ultimate irony is that Malcolm Turnbull stole our campaign slogan and called his new funding plan Gonski 2.0. They knew they had to try and kill our campaign off um, in the context of the next election because it trended at the last election as one of the top two issues that voters took to the election. And so everyone in Australia is talking about school funding, the media, the politicians and the public. And the one bit of hope that I have about that is that it's been a long time, a long time in Australia since education's been at the top of the list and we're determined to make sure they keep talking about it up to uh, and beyond the next election. I just want to show you the picture with disability because in terms of disability, this has been tied up into this package as well. Um, we have an additional 250,000 students who've been identified uh, as students that need funding and what the Turnbull government has done, instead of putting more money in, um, they've put in a very small amount, what they've done is recalculated their formula and spread pretty much the same bucket of money across twice as many students, and that means that we have five states now who see an immediate cut in terms of students with disability. So lots of issues for us. The one good thing is that immediately the ALP has come out and said that they will restore the funding um, if they are elected, so I guess you know where we'll be focusing our attention at the next election. But we are having a debate um, about inequality right now in Australia, about the gaps between the rich and the poor. And it's a debate that's really been driven by the ideology of the Prime Minister and his cabinet um, about companies which do not contribute their share of tax and about the wealthiest Australians also not contributing their fair share of taxes. And as educators, we know that the effects of inequality are most uh, broadly felt by those people who live in poverty. Um, our students in our communities and that the best way to bridge those gaps is to invest in our children, in our preschools, in our schools, uh, our vocational education and tertiary education. The Labor leader, Bill Shorten, has actually grasped the fundamentals of this debate and he's polling very well at the moment and he's presenting as a strong choice for the Australian public at the, ne Australian public at the next um, federal election. Perhaps not uh, polling so well as preferred Prime Minister, but the ALP in general has certainly lifted, uh, lifted the game in terms of their own polls. Um, 
We, so he's, as I said, he's pledged to restore these cuts. Uh, we've also had Sally McManus uh, elected as the ACTU uh, secretary, and she's leading the charge in terms of a new campaign called Change the Rules, which is directly looking at the issues around inequality uh, in Australia, and she's certainly become the people's champion uh, and leading a united union front uh, towards the next election. So we are a strong movement and the government knows this and they continue to relentlessly chase us by putting legislation into the House which is designed to attack our unions and our rights. Michaelia Cash. This is what we've been dealing with for a while, I'll just let you read that at the moment. But effectively we have legislation in place now which talks about um, uh, um, the our rights as unionists in terms of our rights for collective action and uh, the so-called rights of uh, corporations and governments to chase us and our members if they're taking their uh, democratic, you know, democratic right to improve their conditions. So this is sitting in the parliament um, at the moment uh, and we've got an orchestrated campaign in terms of getting to crossbench senators and trying to get their support for blocking uh, blocking this legislation. And our members are really committed uh, in terms of this campaign. Um, they're not only committed to changing the rules uh, broadly in terms of the social justice issues we face, but also for school funding as they see the first hand the impact of cuts for students that they teach. And I know I'm not uh, telling you anything you don't know here, but we do need strong governments. We need governments that understand the importance of the public school system um, in delivering high quality education for our students. And that means investing in education. It means investing not only in capital works and infrastructure so that our schools have the facilities that they need, but also investing in teacher training, uh, ongoing professional development uh, and other things. And when education budgets in our regions um, fall short of meeting these conditions, then we see increased uh, reports of things such as the neglect of school building maintenance, the inadequate classroom facilities that our people have to work in, issues with the supply and demand of the workforce, you know, attracting and retaining not only our uh, new educators, but attracting and retaining our experienced educators. Um, and where they choose to work. In Australia, we have a very big issue in terms of attracting people to work in our rural, remote uh, and regional locations. Um, and also, uh, the lack of support generally for not only teaching staff, but for our educational support staff um, in all sectors. So we're grappling at the moment with the issue of the profession, the status of the profession and the deprofessionalisation and the attack um, on uh, teachers more broadly. It's a key issue. Um, our members are increasingly working on limited and fixed term contracts. Their workload is increasing. Their professional space is shrinking. Their autonomy is challenged. Their access to professional development is limited and quite often regional. If you're in the metro, metro area, it's much easier to access PD. Um, the challenges I'm sure that many of you face working in remote communities. And the government's solution of all of this, of course, is to remove our resources and to implement a national reform agenda. So we have a number of national uh, reform processes that are underway. The one that's of significant in in interest at the moment is the Gonski uh, Review Number 2, headed up by David Gonski once again. Um, a review process which really has nothing to do with funding, but is all about telling us how we should be teaching and how we should be using the funds in our schools. But we don't need more money to do that because, of course, as you know, schools should be able to do more with less. So our government has a very high focus on standardised testing and I've been interested to hear the conversations that have been happening around morning tea and lunch and whatnot around um, the national standards here. They focus on standardised testing and they've got a culture of blaming the teacher rather than recognising the direct link between inequ the inequities of funding and student achievement. Our schools are told to do more with less and they're also blamed for the plateauing of results that has occurred in the last 10 years of standardised testing. It's narrowed the curriculum uh, as teachers have felt the pressure from governments to improve test results, usually without those additional resources. And it's been used to create league tables. It's been used to create league tables which have one purpose. They beat up on schools and they beat up on the teachers in the schools. 
The government thinks the solution now is not enough to have tests at year three, five, seven and nine, but we have to test grade ones as well. So we need a national phonics test from for the grade ones, a test that we'll import from the UK, which after a six year evalu a, a, an evaluation report after six years in the UK has not shown to improve the literacy capabilities of the students in the UK. I'm sure you know all the reasons why. So this is our, uh, one of the new issues that we're facing um, in Australia. Not enough to test just one group, you've got to test them from the minute they start school. We're also facing uh, the move online of our national testing called NAPLAN, which is a national literacy and numeracy testing. And there have been, uh, there's been a trial program in Australia over the past um, uh, wee while, and that program, uh, that trial program, has pulled up huge problems. We have infrastructure problems. We have broadband problems. We've had teachers having to drive from school to school to collect laptops or computers so that they had enough computers in the school for the kids to do the online test. Apart from all those problems, ACARA, who is the body that manages this, the assessment and reporting body has also said that it's okay for computers to mark creative writing, so the creating writing component of the test. So, of course, you know, when we raised our concerns about this, about the fact that creative writing, you're writing for an audience, you have a sense of purpose, humour, sarcasm, emotions, how in the hell does a computer assess that? Akara said, don't worry, we're going to put in a mitigation approach to make sure that we've got this right. This is, this is serious. So 1,000 pieces of creative writing will be marked by a computer, but also a human. And then if there are any discrepancies between the human and the computer, the test will be spat out and it'll be marked by a third human just to make sure we've got it right. I'm not making this stuff up. This is just, it's just astonishingly crazy. So I'm here to tell you today, we've had enough. We're done. We've had enough with standardised testing, we're done with NAPLAN, and we've publicly withdrawn from NAPLAN online. We're currently getting in the ears of all of the state and territory education ministers and saying, sorry, let me swear, this is bullshit, um, and we are done with this in Australia, and it's time to have a new conversation about assessment and reporting, and about exactly what you were talking about, exactly, well, be, in terms of, um, you know, the journey that our kids have and not being judged by a single test that's taken once a year, which is used by governments to just beat on all of us. So we're working out what our campaign's going to look like, and we're going to reclaim this space in Australia. So I'll, I'll keep you posted. I hope you, I might be able to report next year, see how we're going. But it's a bigger issue for us, because we have to actually regain control over the teaching profession. In Australia, there is a tendency to put what they call educational experts onto boards and bodies, people who've got no idea about education, telling us how to do our business, at the same time excluding us, taking us off of boards and bodies and anything to do with education, um, because God forbid that you'd actually have an educator there talking about education. So. Um, we are going to re regain this control. It's a, we've got a very big concerted effort at the moment about uh, reclaiming um, our agenda and reclaiming the profession. Uh, and that means that we also have to reinforce our role as the profession's guardians because we have the internal challenge of having any constructive, in fact any at all, social uh, or educational dialogue with the government. The government shut the doors. They won't speak to us. They won't meet with us. Um, it's uh, just not going, to, not going to happen. So we've had to find ways around this and I think that the notion of navigating together has been really quite critical as part of this because uh, we've had to engage our allies in the community uh, and our members but also other unions. And we have developed a much closer working relationship with the Independent Education Union in Australia. Um, uh, for those of you who know anything about the Independent Education Union, you'll know that they're the union that covers the private sector. So you can see there would be many things that we don't have in common, particularly around um, you know, public and private and uh, the resourcing issue. Uh, and it's not always easy, but we do try and come together as much as possible, particularly where we have common ground, particularly around the professional issues, uh, and work out how we can campaign together. And I can tell you that even on the issue of school funding, the IU publicly campaigned against Turnbull's funding plan. And so we have found that we are able to work together more often than not. And it's very, very important because when we have a united front, it's much more difficult for the government to outmanoeuvre us. 
So as I've said, we've got a couple of very important campaigns. Our goal for our school funding campaign will be 100%. It is frankly unacceptable that any government should tell our public schools that they will get 5% below the minimum benchmark that other schools have. So that's going to be a very, very big focus for us as we um, come, out of this, uh, come out of this area. I was in, you, you picked up my comments, but one of the things that you know, is really pissing me off at the moment is we are having this conversation about rich and poor in Australia. We're back into the private and public space. And when we see stories in the paper day after day of elite private schools that are receiving millions of dollars from the Turnbull government and using it to build wellness centres, cricket pitches, swimming pools, relaxation tanks last week, relaxation tanks. Fabulous, but why can't we all have them? You know, um, it's, a, it's become a, an issue, a great issue of divide. So Malcolm may think he's solved the Gonski issue, but he hasn't. We're resolute. And uh, one of the things that um, I guess I just want to leave you with today is that I think our significant strength as, un as education unions is that we are collegiate. We know how to work together. We know how to campaign together. We know how to learn from each other and to share the stories of our successes and our failures. And fundamentally, we have that commitment to the transformative power of education and the difference that that can make in a, child li a child's life. And no government will ever, ever defeat us on this. So by navigating together, we stay stronger together. Thank you, friends.